what really happened on that day almost 2,000 years ago, the day that Jesus was crucified? Well, lots of things happened. And um, now reading through Matthew 27 has highlighted some of those things. But there was even more than that. Um, you know, Pilate saw there was no reason to execute Jesus. The crowd wanted a murderer set free instead of Jesus. So they wanted a murderer instead of a man who healed the sick and welcomed children and mixed with social outcasts and rejects and taught the things of God like no one else had ever taught before. They preferred a murderer, a guilty murderer. So much happened on that day that movies have been made out of it because it's full of action. It's full of action and it's full of drama. There was also the earthquake. In the temple, the curtain um, was torn from top to bottom and this curtain was uh, incredibly important because it blocked off the holiest of holy the place that only one person could go once a year. And all of a sudden the curtain's torn and, and, and you see the, the priest down the bottom in this picture, um, maybe they're, they're wobbly because of the earthquake or, or maybe they're terrified because they're not supposed to see into the Holy of Holies. It was the sacred place. And did you also notice in the reading something that um, you might have a tendency to skip over in, in verse 20, um, uh, sorry, in verse 52 it says, you know, when the, when the earth shook and the, and the rock split, it says the tomb, tombs broke open. And the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And they came out of their tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city, that is Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. Wow, isn't that, isn't that astounding? I've got so many questions about that, and none of them are answered in Scripture. But that's, that's so astounding that it might shock people into thinking none of this is true. The action and the drama, um, it, 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 it captures our senses and it moves our hearts. But all this stuff is only on the surface, relatively speaking, to what happened that day. Something more profound happened than can be captured in movies. Something deeper. Something deeper was going on at the God level. And to think about this deeper thing that's happening at the God level, I want us to look at Romans chapter 3. And uh, really, really focusing on verse 25 at this point. And um, I just wanted to read the first few verses, uh, last verses in the previous verse, so just so it flows a little bit, but this is what I want you to think about. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward, that is God the Father, put forward as a propitiation by his blood. That's from the English Standard Version. So I want to get a bit technical today and I want to focus on that word propitiation. And as we focus on this word, it'll help us get beyond the human action that we read of in this story and go to the God level of what was really happening on this day. Now I've included the Greek word there, um, partly for artistic effect, I think it looks pretty. Um, but it's also to show you that um, behind the word that translated propitiation is a word that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to use at this point. A lot of our modern English translations have the phrase like sacrifice of atonement, which is good. Um, but the ESV is reviving the word that's used in some of the older English translations. And I think it's important for us to think about this word because it says so much when we understand it, propitiation. 
as something new that the kids can take away with them as well. Propitiation. Here's a definition. I've got a couple for you. Here's a definition of propitiation. A payment that satisfies divine wrath by the removal of our guilt. Here's a second definition. Similar. The turning away of wrath by the satisfaction of, of violated justice. The turning away of wrath, the removal um, of our guilt and therefore um, it satisfies divine wrath. As you think about those definitions, and I'll leave them up there for a little bit, I'm going to try a couple of illustrations. Um, preachers all over the world since this time of the death of Jesus have um, come up, tried to come up with different illustrations, and they have all illustrations have their limitations. But let me just give you two and see if that helps you understand what these definitions for the word propitiation are getting at. Let's say I back into your car. That's hard to imagine, but it might happen. <laughs> and I cause extensive damage, and it's completely my fault. Justice would require that I cover the costs of the repair. So what that means is I am now in debt to you. Of course, I can't afford to pay for that repair, so I'm in deep trouble. How will you get justice that gives you back your car? Well, the insurance company says, fear not, justice will be served, the debt will be paid. It is a payment that covers the guilt of my error and I hope our friendship is restored because your car's fixed. And it doesn't cost you anything to have your car fixed. And it looks like nothing ever happened to it. It might even look better than before I ran into it. The insurance co company has covered my debt. Or let's imagine, which it might be even easier, that I have said something or done something that completely breaks your trust and deeply offends you. What can be done? What can be done to satisfy the injustice and the hurt that I have committed? Other than just pretending it didn't happen, what could be done so that the offence was like it never happened? How could it be covered? There is no insurance company to cover me for this. The reason Jesus died as a propitiation was to cover a relationship injustice towards God. Everyone here, without exception, has offended God. Everyone who has lived on planet Earth from the very beginning except for Jesus has offended God by failing to live in perfect purity and justice 100% of the time from infancy to death. And you and I can accept our moral imperfections and our failures because we're so used to it. We've grown up with it, and it just seems normal. But our moral imperfections and our failures offend God because they are a violation of what he designed you and me to be. So with this in mind, I want to go back to Romans chapter 3, but back a few more verses and, and kick off back at verse 23 and work our way just through these, first, these few verses. 
For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a free gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. First, let's think about the problem. The problem is all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The, and the ultimate cost of falling short of the glory of God, that is the 100% purity that he designed us to live by, the ultimate cost is the death penalty. It says in chapter 6, verse 23, the wages or the income of sin is death. That's the problem. Um, now the solution. What is a solution? We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God, the Father, put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Jesus is a bit like the insurance company, which says, Fear not, justice will be served, the debt will be paid, I pay the debt. The cost of our sin, which offends God, is death, and Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to pay that debt. That's what we've been singing about in the songs, and it's spelt it out so clearly. And, and the death of Jesus, Jesus who is perfect in every way, covers our sin, sinful nature, our sinful behavior, our sinful thoughts, because it satisfies. It satisfies the need for justice, and it satisfies the purity of God's nature. And because God's justice and the purity of his nature is satisfied, the relationship can be restored. And the relationship offence is healed. The final point, so there's uh, the problem, there's a solution, but there's a final step. And the final step for you and me, um, I, I put in slightly bold, bolder print there, is that it's to be received by faith. Faith By faith just means trust. You've got to put your trust in it. You have to put your trust in what Jesus has done for it to be effective for you. Jesus, I want your payment on my behalf to cover me. If you don't put your trust in what Jesus has done, you will not be covered by what he has done. God the Father will even be more offended if you do not receive his free gift, his wonderful free gift. And that will be added to the harm in the relationship between you and God. And whatever you do in your life, the most important decision you ever have to make is this decision. Will I trust in Jesus and what he has done, his propitiation, to cover me in my relationship with God? And maybe you need more time to think it through. You might be in that space at the moment. Um, there are people here who would love to help you with that. We have uh, this great website, Think, think Life, Think Jesus. It's, uh, you can find it by going onto our web, web page and look under the resources. But it's a dedicated website for you to explore all things about Jesus. But I do need to say, in your exploration, that this is the only solution that can solve the relationship divide between you and God. And it's not just the only solution, it is God's solution. God designed it. You see, he, he put forward Jesus as a propitiation. God designed this. And he did it at great personal cost to himself, so it has to be good. It has to be the solution that works. It's his solution to the problem that we have, and he's giving it as a free gift if we're willing to trust what Jesus has done. In a moment, we're going to sing a song, a final song, and it has the words in it, the wrath of God was satisfied. 
Now, I think it was back in about 2012, some people were compiling a hymn book from a certain denomination, and they wanted to suggest a change to this song. Instead of having the words, the wrath of God was satisfied, they wanted instead, the love of God was magnified. And they wrote to the authors and said, can we change it to the love of God was magnified? And it's absolutely true. The love of God was magnified. There's no doubt about that in the most amazing way. But what they were trying to do by um, changing the words that were there, they were trying to avoid the fact that there's something about us, there's something in us that offends God and hurts God and makes God angry. They were trying to avoid that. How can there be something in us that's offensive to God? Or why would God be offended by us humans? They were trying to avoid that. The authors refused to allow them to change the words. And rightly so, because it's at the heart of this song, at the meaning of the song. And it's at the heart of what really happened 2,000 plus years ago. And it's also why the curtain in the temple miraculously tore from top to bottom and exposed the Holy of Holies because it symbolised in the death of Jesus that, that there's no longer any barrier between our ability, anyone's ability and right to come into the presence of God. Before it was only one person one time a year, but in the death of Christ, access to God is open to everyone. Any time. Why? Because the barrier of our guilt has been removed. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, help us to accept that we, by our very nature, have offended you. And that we desperately need this offence resolved. And help us to always hang on to the, the realisation, the truth, the revelation that it can be resolved through the gift of Jesus being a propitiation for us. The payment that satisfies and removes the offence of our guilt. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for doing this. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our propitiation. Amen.